Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. As you can see, I've got yet another change of scenery in my background here. That's because I finally moved into a place in Chicago, which is pretty sweet, so no complaints there. Uh, the one thing is I am living alone for the first time, which means that uh, I have a lot more responsibility. I'm also a lot more likely to go completely insane. And if I do, that would make these YouTube videos a little bit more interesting. So, uh, you know, in the best interest of all of us, let's see if that happens. Hopefully it does. Uh, but without further ado, let's start talking about some replication. I put you guys on about a three week wild goose chase to talk about CRDTs, so let's get back into it. All right, so today we're gonna get started by talking about leaderless replication. So the gist of leaderless replication is pretty simple and you can see it right down here. But basically now, instead of just writing to one node, which we've always done in the past, we're actually going to write to a bunch of different nodes. So that's chaos, we're gonna be doing it even at the same time, and to make matters even worse, we're also gonna be reading from a ton of nodes. So everything that we know so far, throw it right out the window because things are about to get real. So let's move on. Where do we actually use leaderless replication? Again, I'm gonna try and make an emphasis on actually pointing out some systems that do these things, so you, know, you can contextualize these videos a little bit. Uh, this is definitely used in Cassandra, that's probably the most popular one, open source database. RIAC is another open source database, very similar to Cassandra. And then you may happen to think that this is used in DynamoDB, which many people seem to say online. However, they would be incorrect because actually uh, this type of leaderless replication was originally invented in the open source Amazon Dynamo paper, but DynamoDB, as far as I can tell, seems to use single leader replication. It's kind of unclear. I would not say that DynamoDB uses leaderless replication if it were to come up in an interview. Okay, so let's move on. How does this thing actually work? So here's a very realistic scenario. We've got Kate Upton, as per usual, on the left over here, and she is going to write that Jordan is cute to a few different databases. So let's say that she writes it to two of them. So as you can see, we have three different databases, each of them with basically some sort of snapshot versioning. We've spoken about this in the past, but let's imagine that uh, the Jordan key has a version. So originally it starts out as version 20 on all three of these databases. And then the two that get the right, which are this guy and this guy, are now updating version 21 to Jordan equal to Q. Then of course, Jordan is going to read those values from these two databases and he's going to see the following. Version 21 of Jordan equals Q, version 20 of Jordan equals ugly. So technically we have two conflicting values here of the Jordan key, but keep in mind that that's what these versions are for, right? Because we know that 21 is greater than 20, we know that the actual most up-to-date value is that Jordan is equal to Q. And another actually cool thing that you can do in this leaderless replication is me, being Jordan, can see that you know this guy, this database over here, database number three, has an outdated value for Jordan. And so he's actually going to write back saying, hey, for version number 21, we know that Jordan is actually equal to Q. So then this guy over here is going to basically update its value and say, oh, you know what? I just got a new update. It turns out Jordan is actually Q. And the process of actually taking a database with a stale value and updating it after performing a read is known as read repair, so this is important to know. And the reason that's useful is because it is one of the basically two main ways that we can make sure that our data values are up to date. So let's take a look at the other way of ensuring that our values are up to date. So this one is called anti-entropy. So the gist here is we've got these two leader databases or just in general databases because there isn't really a leader in this setup and the list of letters below are the writes that they've processed. So this guy on the left is processed A, C, E, F, and G, and on the right, he's processed B, C, D, F, and G. So let's imagine then that uh, basically the left database wants to replicate all of those changes to the database on the right so that they have at least similar data, right? So typically in a single leader or a multi-leader setup, we would use the replication log, right? And that's just gonna be one long list of all the writes that have happened on that node and you're passing each write one at a time over the network from one database to the other. However, in this case, it doesn't really make sense to do that. The reasoning being that this database over here on the right is probably already going to have a lot of the information that is contained on the left because of the fact that writes go to multiple places. So we don't actually wanna send every write that might be in a replication log, but we actually only want to send select writes 
that are present on the node on the left, but not present on the node on the right. So that's the whole point over here. We only want to send writes A and E. So how can we actually quickly tell which writes to send? Well, the easiest way would be to literally scan through all of the val values and writes present on the left node that are not present in the right node. However, there are a couple of issues with that. The first one being that these are large tables. And when you have large tables, in order to perform a scan over them, that is linear time complexity. It takes a while to perform. And additionally, it might have to be a ton of data that we're sending over the network to basically have those two databases confirm with one another that uh, you know one has certain rows and the other doesn't. So what can we do instead that's better? Well, it's time to introduce a concept known as the Merkle tree. So I've spoken about this in the past on my channel, but for the new series, obviously we're gonna reintroduce it. So here's how a Merkle tree would work. So let's imagine we have a database that looks like this right here. So we've got four rows and basically it's a key value pair of A equals 10, B is 45, C is 63, and D is seven. So I'll explain how these Merkle trees work in a little bit, but the general gist is that you want to use them to tell how two database tables differ really quickly and efficiently. So let's create the Merkle tree for our database table right here. So the first thing that we're gonna do, this is step one, is we take the hash of each row. So let's imagine that our hash function generates output from zero to a thousand, and these numbers right here are the four outputs that we get from hashing. Then from there, we're going to take all pairs of hashes, we're going to sum them up, and then we're also going to take hashes of those. So in this case, 762 plus 127 is 889, hence why we're taking uh, the hash of 889, and we do the sum again, and we take the hash of 1339. So now, finally, we have 574 and 626. And then we're gonna do that same step one more time until we get to one root node, right? So we take these two, we sum them up, Conveniently, they sum up to 1,200. We take the hash of them, and let's imagine that spits out 213, which leads us to our final result over here on the right. So 213 is going to be our root node of the Merkle tree with two children as 574, 626. And then, of course, we're going to have our leaf nodes, which are 762, 127, 901, and 438. So let's scroll down a little bit more because we've seen how to create a Merkle tree but how can they actually be useful for us? So let's imagine now that we have two database tables, right? We've got uh, all four rows again, we've got A, B, C, and D, and the only difference between the two of them is that as you can see here, B is equal to six, and on the right, B is equal to nine. So what can we use these Merkle trees to do? Well, let's say we took a look at these two trees and we said, all right, where are these databases different? Just using the Merkle trees. So we'll start by looking at the root nodes between them. We've got 305 and 642. Those two are not equal. So clearly there's gotta be a difference somewhere in this Merkle tree, right? The next thing we would do is start with the children. Let's do a breath first search for now. So we'll take a look at 119 and we'll say 119 is different than 505. So we know eventually we'll have to keep going down this path. Similarly, or actually in this case differently, 463 is equal to 463 on the right. So we actually don't have to care about any of these entries over here because we know that everything under 463 is highly likely to be the same. We don't have to take a look at those or worry about it. All we have to do is inspect the left half of this tree right now. So now, moving on down our tree, we can see that 746 is equal to 746. So we've got no issues there. Like I said, A is 10 in both trees. But then finally, because 821 is different than 314, we found our difference between the two trees. It's just the fact that B is equal to nine versus B is equal to six. And now if these were two databases, for example, we could send the fact that B is equal to six to this guy over the network. We're only sending one row instead of the whole table, so it's much more efficient. And then it can change its value and say, oh shoot, B is equal to six. The really nice thing about this, again, is instead of having to do a linear scan over the whole table and figure out where they're different, this is in O of log N. Why? Because we're creating a binary tree and binary trees are basically continuing to split the table into two over and over and over again and that gives us logarithmic time complexity. So for now, basically that is going to be the introductory video for leaderless replication, but next time around, we are going to get into a very, very important concept, which we didn't touch upon too much just yet. And so the point there is that 
So far, we've seen how writes will go from one database to another in the cluster, but what we haven't seen is how we can actually guarantee that if I'm a guy on the left here and I'm writing to a few nodes, how do I know that my guy on the right is going to see that right away? Because right now, the guy on the right has to wait for something like anti-entropy. He could, in theory, do some read repair, but if he were doing read repair, that would be reliant on the fact that one of these two nodes that he's reading from is going to be one of the three that gets written to. So read repair isn't actually going to work for us here. You have to wait for some unclear amount of time for anti-entropy to happen, and sometimes that's not good enough. So in theory, there is a way that we can actually guarantee that this guy on the right is going to make sure that he sees all of the writes made by the guy on the left. And that is going to be the topic for next video. Anyways, guys, have a good one. I'll see you in the next one, and I'm looking forward to it.